the many virulence factors of a great pathogen um, called Streptococcus pyogenes. And so this is the main organism that causes strep throat, for example, and it has a whole bunch of different armaments. It's got some structural features, so it has a capsule, and here's the big capsule. Um, it has, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a variety of fimbrial antigens, including something called M protein, which allows it to be antiphagocytic. It has something called protein F that sticks out of it that allows it to bind to fibronectin, which is uh, pretty um, intimately associated with the cells of the um, human body. And so that gives the microbe the ability to stick closely to those cells and then establish a focal point of infection. The microbe also has lipotechoic acids because it's gram positive. And so there's a lipotechoic acid that can use to bind to surfaces. And naturally, it produces a whole bunch of exotoxins, things that it secretes out into the environment. And so there are things like hyaluronidase, which breaks down hyaluronic acid, which um, in this particular case is a common host uh, material in connective tissue. The micro produces streptokinases. These kinases, as you see here, can lyse fibrin, and so they can actually break up clots and allow the microbe to spread. They, they produce these um, <coughs> strepto, stre, streptodonases, which are um, nu nucleases, so these guys here, that digest RNA and DNA, and streptolysin. Streptolysins are, are things that outright kill um, host cells, like phagocytic cells. And they do that for a reason. You know, they often want to kill the cell to get all the nutrients out of it. <laughs> and so that causes a lot of damage. And so a lot of the inflammation and soreness that you would have in a sore throat, a strep throat would come from a lot of these different toxins, particularly the streptolysins. And so um, <clears throat> the, the, the main things are listed here that you see here. So, you know, kinase goes with kinase and lysin, you know, goes with lysin and so forth. This is an overview of, of um, typically of a salmonella infection in the small intestines. And so the seminal bacteria would often be taken in by an M cell. M cells are normal um, features of the, immune, of the immune system in the digestive tract. And so the, the job of the M cell is to, is to determine whether or not something belongs, a particular micro belongs or not. And so they'll bring in antigens, bring in microbes, and then present those microbes to the macrophage, the immune response below in the bloodstream, in the, in the, in the uh, um, basal, basal surface of the cell down here. And the macrophage can then destroy the microbe and alert the immune response to the presence of that particular microbe. That's normally how it's supposed to happen. But what happens with salmonella in some cases is that the salmonella can survive and grow inside the macrophage and cause uh, an infection. Often what they'll do, the salmonella will do, is they'll grow inside the macrophage and they'll bust back out and then they'll pop back in to the basal surface of the cells and reinfect the intestinal lining. And so then they, that causes the, the diarrhea and cramping and vomiting and so forth that's associated with salmonella. And obviously we have other things that are designed to attack them, like dendritic cells. These are phagocytic cells that would reach up and grab things and try to ingest them before they cause a big problem. But if this happens, usually the salmonella wins, and then, you know, for a few days, you're pretty miserable. And you can watch this little um, YouTube video just to get a, a sense for the um, salmonella invasion. It also talks a, a bit about some of the virulence factors, such as the um, type 3 secretion systems, which I'll show you in a subsequent slide. But this YouTube video gives you um, a bit of extra um, resources to study those virulence factors. So Listeria monocytogenes causes an invasive infection as well, <clears throat> just like salmonella. And so here you see the organisms being brought in by M cells, but rather than being processed by macrophages below, they can sort of escape the vacuoles and then zip around inside the cells, as you see here. 
using host cell active. That's what it says here. And then they, they're moving around in the cells and they can actually punch their way through the cell membranes of adjacent cells and spread laterally. Listeria often is, um, infects people through contaminated food. That's the main one. And often it's, you know, undercooked or, or not uncooked deli meats and, and people who um, uh, undercook things like hot dogs or eat hot dogs raw. <laughs> so that's often why I tell people to, you know, it's not a bad idea to, you know, cook your deli meat, for example, like fry your turkey quickly or fry your ham if you're in a vulnerable um, population such as an individual that's pregnant. So the bacteria can actually enter the circulation, pass through the placenta, and infect the fetus and cause damage or, or stillbirth. Um, listeria can also invade the intestinal mucosa, enter the circulation, and in most cases be cleared by healthy people. Most of you have probably eaten listeria at some point in your life and that didn't even know it. They can also... Um, in, in people with immunosuppression or the elderly, for example, can uh, undergo, um, can spread basically and, un, and cause a fulminating systemic infection such as meningitis and meningitis where they punch into the central nervous system and infect the meninges. So <clears throat> this diagram, or I'm sorry, this um, video gives you a, a sense of basically what happens here in, 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 in a real-life micrograph. So leaving the host must occur if the microbes to be perpetuated. The last thing it wants to do is go down with the ship. <laughs> Most bacteria leave by a passive mechanism. They're either pooped or peed or, or sneezed or coughed or whatever out. <clears throat> a lot of microbes produce pathogenicity islands, and these are um, hunks of DNA that carry large groups of virulence genes typically, and usually they're acquired by horizontal gene transfer. And what, what that mostly means is, you know, usually they're acquired by microbes um, giving them to each other through pili, through, through mating pili or sex pili. So um, type, uh, the, the type three secretion systems can occur on pathogenicity islands. And these are, again, bunches of proteins that allow microbes to um, inject effector molecules into a susceptible host cell. The type 3 secretion systems are basically syringes and they're modeled after flagella. They look very similar to flagella at the level of the amino acid sequence. And so here's the needle part right here that would stick into a, um, a host cell. And then the, the, this motor part right there will take an effector molecule like my pointer dot here and go right in and allow it to inject into a susceptible host. So it looks something like this then when you look at when you look at the type 3 systems of salmonella. And again, go back to the um, to this uh, <clears throat> to this YouTube video and you can see the uh, an animation of this of this event that I'm showing you here. And so basically the salmonella use their type type 3 secretion system pictured here. And the type 3 secretion system is encoded by something called SPI, which is Salmonella Pathogenicity Island. This SPI injects effector molecules into the cell that trigger the cell to, um, to essentially phagocytose the bacteria. You can see it kind of changing the shape of the apical surface here to bring the microbe in. The microbe comes into a vacuole and then uses a second type 3 secretion system from SPI2, from a second pathogenicity island, and that injects additional effector molecules. And what that does then is allows the microbe to survive in the vacuole without being destroyed. Typically what happens when a cell takes in something like this, something called a lysosome will, will attach to the vacuole and, and release toxins and kill whatever's in the vacuole. And so here's a little bit more detail of that. You don't need to really know all these little detailed proteins, but um, anyway, but the point is, is that the, the uh, type three system is like a little mini syringe. And so this is the bacterium here. And then the syringe needle actually sticks into the host cell, host cell cytosol and pr pumps in some kind of effector molecule. 
Toxigenicity, um, <clears throat> there's a few terms that go along with that. One of them is intoxications. These are important, uh, often in food micro. These are diseases that result from a specific toxin produced by bacteria. Um, some toxins are only produced during a host infection. So the, 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 you, can, you can break these into a few categories, but um, when a microbe invades the body, and the primary cause of disease is because of a toxin, we can call that an, an intoxication. There's a different version of intoxication that happens as well, and this is when a microbe gets into a food and then produces toxins in the food. So even if you kill the bacteria in the food, if the toxin stays active and you eat it, you can still get sick. And so there's a microbe, Staphylococcus aureus, which causes these types of foodborne intoxications in which the microbe resides often on people's hands and in their nose. And if some, you know, cook or chef or, you know, dessert chef is preparing a fresh cream or some kind of dessert like that where there's no cooking involved, the um, individual can inoculate Staphylococcus into that product. And again, the staph can grow and then produce their toxin. And so if the, and if the toxin's not destroyed, the toxin can make you sick. So it's not even necessary, the live microbe isn't necessary in that type of intoxication. So a toxin is just a specific substance that induces some kind of host damage. And toxemia is a general term for toxins in the blood. This is a, um, a table comparing exotoxins and endotoxins. So um, exotoxins are protein toxins. So typically a microbe will actually preform the proteins in, the, in its cytoplasm and then pump them out into the world usually. Excuse me. <laughs> and, and so the, uh, um, whereas endotoxins are a physical part of the bacterial membrane, as I've talked about already. And so that outer portion of the gram-negative outer membrane is the, um, the, in which the lipid A portion it can, is contained is actually toxic. And so a, a microbe, uh, you don't even need the live gram-negative microbe to get somebody sick from endotoxins. If you were infected with a, a gram-negative bacterium and you take an antibiotic and that antibiotic destroys the bacteria, but, their, but the pieces of the bacteria are released in high dosages in your bloodstream, that can still make you sick. So um, in terms of chemical composition, exotoxins are proteins, whereas endotoxins are lipopolysaccharides that exist in the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. Some examples of exotoxin-producing bacteria are botulism, diphtheria, and tetanus, whereas endotoxins, you know, any gram-negative infection can, can result in endotoxin production. The effects on the host are usually variable. Um, you know, typically the fevers are, are really highly associated with endotoxins. And so, anyway, you can read up on the rest of this stuff. The types of exotoxins or protein toxins that micro produce, microbes produce are listed here. There's um, AB toxins that have an A portion and a B portion, which I'll talk about in subsequent slides. There's specific host site exotoxins, you know, the ones that, you know, specifically affect certain kinds of tissues. And then there's the membrane disrupting toxins that specifically focus on membranes. And then lastly, the superantigens, which are toxins which in and of themselves don't really do anything. <laughs> they, but what they do is overstimulate the immune response. So their mere presence, all it does is sets off a, an alarm bell that causes your immune system to go haywire and try to you know, fight whatever it is that triggered it. But in the process of fighting, they end up doing more harm than good. So your immune system is actually the cause of damage. So AB toxins, as I said, consist of an A portion and a B portion. The A portion is the responsible toxic effect and the B portion really just binds the, 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 the material, the toxin, to the surface of the cell. And so that looks something like this. So here's an AB toxin. In this particular case, it's diphtheria toxin. The bacterium that causes diphtheria often will colonize your throat and produce this toxin. 
and the toxin will damage um, the, the membranes in your throat and to the point where it could actually clog your throat, especially if you're a little kid, that's very de deadly. But the toxin can also go into your bloodstream and do have its toxic effects on your heart. And so in some cases, diphtheria ends in death because individuals suffer heart attacks or heart failure. So the toxins B portion binds and the A portion, as you see here, will eventually um, come in together into the cell. The A portion can translocate into the cytoplasm. So what the A portion actually does is it grabs ADP ribose. You see this ADP ribose here? It grabs that molecule off of NAD and sticks that ADP ribose that it steals from NAD onto EF2. EF2 is elongation factor 2, and it's something that we need, you and I need, in order for our, our cells to undergo protein synthesis. So here's my ribosome, and then here's a messenger RNA that's being translated into protein. And elongation factor 2 helps the ribosome move along the messenger RNA for, for protein synthesis. But if your elongation factor 2 has an ADP ribose group on it, it doesn't work, and this stalls, and as a result, that can kill the cell. The membrane-disrupting exotoxins don't have A and B subunits, but there are two types. There's the pore formers and the phospholipases.